Um, I did the structural analysis of curved beams. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the history and then some everyday application kind of of where these curved beams are applied and then some theory. And then I have an example. Actually, go here. There's some papers on that bottom here. I'm going to start to spread those out. I have an example you guys can work along with me. I may have kind of too little, but. Okay, so the history and beginnings of the curved beam. Um, it started with, I actually found a quote in the Art of Structural Engineering, which is a book that I was looking into heavily with the history, and um, it talked about how the structural aspect of engineering is that there cannot be engineering structure which is not made of material and vice versa, So, nor a material which is not made or formed into structure. Um, this kick started an idea that analyzing structure and material is important, and Galileo introduced that in roughly the 1600s. Um, going back even further, the curved beam can kind of start to be derived from um, the Romans where they initiated the arch. And obviously, a curved beam doesn't have a keystone, or you know, it's not typically made up of several pieces, it's just one um, piece that's fluid. But the arch is something that we can look back to, and I believe Bonnie goes over that tomorrow. Um, some of the early examples I found were actually called hammer beams, which were close to the beginning of a curved beam. And it was something um, in a general path of a semicircular shape, which is what a curved beam takes on um, structurally. The first um, mathematicians actually to start to discover the curved beam were Jean Frenet and Joseph Surrey. They have a um, theory called the Frenet Surrey where they talk about the geometric properties of the curve and they start to break down the cross section of it and um, the kinematic particle that moves along it in the third dimension. So we'll talk about today's application. So in today's application, I looked at a lot of different pieces such as the Casey Key guest house. Um, a lot of the times, curved beams can be used for structural purposes, obviously, and then architectural aesthetic, which is a lot of what they're used for today as far as um, making both of those purposes. So the Casey Key guest house I found um, at Architizer and the architect has said that his favorite part, or even the guest here, it's found in Florida, um, said that their favorite part was that the curve beam helped blur the distinction between the structural aspect and then the actual, you know, nice aesthetic appeal as well. Um, the commercial uses um, found that strength was in scale, so the bigger the better. So I found that a ton of the Hummer, actually the Hummer dealerships across the nation actually use curved beams, they almost all use that same building structure. So there's the curved beams that they use as kind of a big open facade, and then they can park the vehicles, and then there's, um, you know, a big age for Hummer and such. But um, it was said in a Chicago Tribune that I found that it was a simple but high impact. It made it really dynamic, but it was also structurally sound. Um, other uses were, this is crane hooks, which is one of the examples we'll do um, for Today's application, you can analyze crane hooks, which are curved as well. There's pipes, bridges many times use it, and things that are weight-bearing with some kind of force um, use the analysis of curved beams. So here's some of the basic theory. Um, we can start with the elementary flexural formula, which we know is a moment over, a moment over inertia. So actually, I was reading that if the curved beam is, has a depth of a cross section that's less than the radius of curvature, and you can use this top picture here, that it's considered slender. So if it's slender, you have h is less than r. And um, actually, it's actually um, that when looking at all of these equations, there's four main topics. There was the geometry of the region, there's the loading that applies in the region, the equilibrium, and the deformation. So for the deformation, we have the relationship between the change in x from the top picture, there's your axis is in the x, y, and you have the your relationship between the two of your rotation and your x is, the change in x is equal to the radius times the change in the angle. So for the equilibrium, which was one of the four main points, um, the relationship, or the summing of the forces for this equilibrium is gonna be all of the summings of this picture in the middle. So you need to sum all of your forces and for this case, the QY, which are all of these pieces going out and up like this, is actually the average of all of those in that element for the cross-section. 
Um, some other pieces of theory that are included for this cross section on the bottom is that you need to sum the forces in the tangential direction and you need to find the moment equilibrium about the z axis. So here's your two equations. And I've expanded more on that in my paper. There's some more theory there about how to use it and how to apply it. And then um, the only time that the cross section, or the only time that we use an MY is when the cross section is. Metric. So here we have the normal and shear forces in the image right here. So you have your normal, that's the equation for the normal force and the shear force, and then the moment, unless the cross section is symmetric, about x, y, there is a moment. So if they're perfectly symmetric, there's not, but in that case there is. And now we can run an example. So here's a um, hook, which I said earlier, crane hook, it's a weight bearing thing. So we're going to be finding the stresses in BC here. And if you cut directly across it, the book that I used for the example chose to take a trapezoidal shape. And you can, there's kind of two, a bigger trapezoid and a smaller trapezoid. So it's given that P, which is actually at the top of the hook right there, you can't see it in the picture because it kind of blurred it, but P was 20 kilonewtons. Um, we're given that the cross-section analysis can be two trapezoids. Um, we know that the area will be both of the areas added together and that the eccentricity equation is given there. So first we need the area of the entire thing. And then from there we can find, we need the centroid of the smaller trapezoid and the centroid of the larger. So this will get us later to the moment, which will get us to the uh, stress. So let's see. Next, we have to find the radius of the cross section, and we need both the trapezoids' radius. So first we'll find DC, which was one of the trapezoids. That was the radius of that one. And then the radius of BD was the other one. And then to take the overall radius of the entire cross section, you can add those together and find that area. And then the entire cross section is this one plus the 29 plus the 9 and you get 39.31 millimeters, and then that's for the entire cross-section, the radius of the entire cross-section. Next, we can use the radius Rn to the neutral axis of pure bending, and we can solve for the eccentricity, which is the equation we were given at the beginning. So there's our radius to the neutral axis. We can take the area over our total that we found previously, and we get 54.44 millimeters, and there's our eccentricity. So from there, we can use the bending moment to finalize finding the stress in B and at C. So we know the bending moment is equal to the force that we are given times the radius. We rounded it to 60, it was 60.05. Um, you can just round there, and you get 1.2 times 10 to the 6 Newton millimeters. And then from there, we can find the circumferential stresses at B and C on the hook where we cut it um, at that curved portion of the hook so we can see the stresses here. So there was the stress at B and there was the stress for C. So that was a, a pretty quick rundown of an example of how you find the stresses on some weight bearing curved something. There's a beam, a screen, again a pipe, a hook, etc. So um, there's more Backup, or I guess background theory, if you guys would like to read more of it, it's in the latter half of my paper um, under theory. And any questions, comments, concerns? I apologize. I missed, can you go back to the first slide sure. of the example? Sorry. Right. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that paper can kind of help you guys kind of understand how to solve those. Thank you.